Thank you for coming. My name is Cheryl Lee Beebe. I'm from California by way of Canada. And I was an aquatic therapist in Canada and started working in water in the early 1990s and um, got into with the Aquatic Therapy and Rehab Institute uh, and was so keen. I was a volunteer and then uh, before you know it, I was hired to be a presenter and presented for them for 16 years, which put me at many, many conventions. One year I did 12 conventions, so you know, when you attend, you don't not only teach, but you get to go to other people's presentations. So I acquired a, a good base of knowledge and, uh, and I love to share that with people. So thank you for coming and being interested. Um, aquatic therapy is by and large the best first step for you in, in rehab. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, water is the great equalizer. It, it levels the playing field. You may not be walking on land, but you can walk in water and you can do, uh, you can dance in water. You can be graceful in water. You can um, move in ways that are impossible on land because of the principles of water. There's, there's basically six magical principles of water that create an environment for rehab that is hard to touch by any other therapy. However, after a certain period of time, aquatic therapy brings you to the place where you can start working on land more safely, start taking on, on more. So it's a good first step, and also it, um, there's no end to how hard you can work out in the water. Water's resi water resists every movement you do. The harder you push against the water, the hard, harder it pushes back. So athletes um, will go into the water for their rehab too and get a benefit that's good for them. And it, so it's good for, for everybody along the scheme of things. So I'll talk about safety first. When we're on land and your muscles are deteriorating from myositis, there's a risk of falling, there's balance issues, fear issues, which may prevent you from doing activities in life, may prevent you from um, being able to get therapies. If, if you need two therapists to hold you up for gait training, it's not sustainable, it's too expensive, the facility won't provide it for long, um, so it's not necessarily doable. Once you're able to ambulate on your own, then all those land therapies are, are more accessible to you. So when you're in the water, the water helps hold you up. So you might flail on land with your balance, but that buoyant support, the vertical upwardness, helps to lift your chest from here to here. You might need um, a float, around your chest, or even water wings, or uh, a noodle, mm -hmm. a pool noodle, or, or barbells to hold you up can be helpful. Holding the wall can be helpful. Um, and you can do many exercises still holding that support. If you fall in the water, there's nothing hard to fall upon. And when you fall, you fall slowly because water resists the action. So you have time to recover. Hopefully you're working with a therapist that's you know, right there with you. It'll get you through that place until your water's safe. So one of the first things I do in, in sessions is to make sure people are water safe. So we practice falling forward, we practice falling backwards, and then recovering our feet. It's a great core exercise uh, besides. So that should be, you know, one of the first things that are done in aquatic therapy sessions to make sure your water is safe. Say, for instance, you have an injury or ranges of motion where there's a lot of pain. So if I open my arm like this, and I typically, it, um, when I open, go into that range, I'll get a shot of pain um, that prohibits me from wanting to do that move. When you're in the water, if water's resistance slows down the movement. 
And so now there's, there's no momentum. The water takes away the momentum or the uncontrolled aspects of movement. So the brain has a moment of time to perceive, to be able to be aware of where your body is in space so that you can work in those ranges that are painful and start to slow down. The water will slow you down even faster. And so you can move into those painful ranges with awareness and start to open them up and recover them again. And so there's a safety built in with the resistance of the water. Buoyancy. Buoyancy is an upward thrust. Gravity is a downward thrust. So when we're on land, everything we do is affected by gravity. So for instance, when I walk on land, my heavy leg is resisted by gravity. But when I drop this leg to follow through with my step, it's gravity assisted. So the muscles on the front of my body get stronger from working against gravity, but my hamstrings are assisted by gravity, so everything back here starts to get soft. The only way it doesn't soften up is if you're cycling mm -hmm. up stairs or running or, or walking up hills. So one of the benefits of water exercise is uh, ah, is um, the cross-training effect, the absolute opposite of what it is on land. So everything that's left weak from land exercise or land ambulation is counteracted in the pool. So it works for a great cross-training. So when I lift my leg in the water, buoyancy has this upward thrust. I have to work hard to pull that leg down. I'll do exercises on purpose that work those hamstrings so that when you have myositis and your, your quads and the anterior tip uh, start to weaken from the disease, you can strengthen the muscles on the posterior side to provide some additional support. So these muscles here, if they're weakening because of the myositis, uh, they can gain support from other muscle groups uh, based on water exercise. Um, so, buoyancy. When we work against um, buoyancy in the water, every motion we do downward is resisted by buoyancy. But any direction that we move in water is resisted by water's viscosity. So if I work, if I pull my arm this way, I work all of these muscles. If I push my arm this way, it works all the muscles in the back. When I'm on land, if I'm doing a bicep, tricep curl, when I bring the barbell up, I'm working my bicep. When I lower that weight down, I'm also working the bicep. So if there are different contractions. My muscle shortens when I raise a, a barbell on land. And then the muscle lengthens while it's working when I lower it. What happens is when muscles lengthen while they're working, there's fine micro tears in the muscle. That's one way that muscles rebuild themselves. So when you tear up a muscle, it has to repair itself. But it also makes for a great deal of muscle soreness. So land exercise tends to create a lot of muscle soreness with that micro tearing. When, on the flip side of that, when I'm in the water, I work this muscle, I'm working my bicep. When I lower that equipment down, I'm resisting buoyancy here, and I work the tricep. Are triceps weak, ladies? The, <laughs> right? So everybody wants to get that opposite end of work. I don't need a separate exercise to work the tricep like I do on land. I get both muscle groups in the pair trained equally when I work in the water. So it, it, I can get a simpler program with bigger benefits. With weights in the water? They're, they're styrofoam weights, foam weights, yeah. So that's maybe something you might consider getting, maybe. Um, there's, there's several pool companies where you can get pool equipment if you have your own pool. Yeah. You can, 
that one company is called Kiefer, K-E-I-F-E-R, and they have an aquatic therapy section in their catalog. Um, Sprint Rothhammer also has an aquatic therapy section in their catalog, and you can order things online. Sprint what? Sprint, Sprint Rothhammer. It might come up with just Sprint on a, on a Google search. search yes. Like, the, uh, uh, like a sprint. Like a right. yeah. um, one of the pieces of equipment I like to order uh, are um, lead weights, ankle weights. And so one of the clients uh, that I work with in um, Atherton, in California, um, is one of the board members from the Myositis Association here. And he come, you know, he's walking to the pool um, bench because he sits at a desk uh, all day long. So I take him to the deep end, I put a float on his neck and weights on his feet, and he has floated in the deep end, held here, and the weights pull down. Regular weights? Yeah, and he just does simple leg swinging, leg opening, simple circles, simple cycling, and then he gets out of the pool, and he's all stretched out tall. Wow. So it's nice, you don't have to lay on the rack to get stretched out. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, the you know, five pound weights, one on each ankle, um, can give you um, easy traction in the water. And the, the head float and the weights are available at the, um, the company that I mentioned. Okay. So, Regular weights, um, specific weights like. Yeah, so they don't rust in the swimming pool. Yeah, yeah, they don't. The weights with metal don't last long in the swimming pool. Pardon me? Uh, I am familiar with endless pools, and um, I think there's a lot more bells and whistles than you actually really need. Right. So, yeah, so she's saying that she could share her pool with other people that will use the turbulence and uh, you can walk in it. And it's good. There's benches that go around so you can do seated exercises and seated stabilization exercises. And um, you can do water walking. The, the depth isn't very variable. Deep, having a little bit of deep water is nice so that you can really reach for your moves and learn how to stabilize. When you take your feet off the ground and now you don't have gravity and you don't have something hard under your feet to stabilize you, now you have to stabilize on your own and it brings you right back to that um, interior abilities that we had when we were babies where our core works first before our extremities work. Somehow, as we age our cores, we can, our bellies get soft, and we rely on that strength that we had in our extremities to do everything. So consequently, when we um, rely on our shoulders and not our core, to say to stand up out of a chair, we, we get, say, shoulder injuries or shoulder strains um, at the, the when we don't use our core to help. So one of the things that water is exceptional for is, is reorientating you to stabilize your, your core and body. Okay, hydrostatic pressure. Water squeezes you. When you get into the water, it envelopes your body and puts on a light pressure. A lot of things happen under pressure like that. One of the things is um, your blood can readily re absorb more oxygen under pressure. The veins in your body have one-way valves. And so when the, when the a limb is squeezed, is anybody wearing compression stockings here? Those compression stockings put pressure on the skin and so when blood is pushed forward through our veins, 
they have one way valves, so the, the blood cannot run backwards. And so consequently, that squeezing effect pushes blood towards the heart. Well, when you're in the water, you have that effect to whatever water depth that you're in. And science has shown that even if you sit in a hot tub with water to here, there's numerous positive effects that are happening to your physiology. One of the, besides the, um, the blood being, um, say for instance you have edema in your feet. Um, when you go into the water, you would probably be best off to do deep water um, jogging, deep water cycling, cycling exercises. The deeper a limb is in the pool, the more pressure is experienced. So a foot or a calf with edema will, will go in swollen and come out of the pool nice and slim and the color changes because when that flesh is under pressure holding all that blood in, it gets that rosacea color and uh, so you, your legs look better when you come out than when you come in. So typically when I'm standing here my whole physiology is affected by gravity. You can start to see it. <laughs> I thought I'd never worry about that, but now every once in a while I look in the mirror and I go, wouldn't I look better if it were just up? <laughs> better on the moon. <laughs> Speaking of which, better on the moon, um, all the studies around water were done by NASA to discover the effects of non-gravity environment on the human body. So all those studies about water that we know of were done by NASA for that purpose. So when I'm standing here, the gravity um, pulls most of my blood volume is in my thighs, my hips, and my belly. My heart has to work to pump the blood up here. So that's why the heart has to pump so much more when our arms are up in the air. When I stand in the water, that squeezing effect of the, of the water pushes the blood volume from my lower body up to my, my chest, which has profound effects on the heart and the lungs. So uh, the heart is going along, it's pumping its regular way, and I'm entering the pool steps, and I'm going into the water, and the water level is coming up. All of a sudden, there's a volume of blood around the heart that the heart hasn't seen <laughs> in a while, or maybe not, a, uh, not ever if you're not a pool person. And um, the heart goes to pump its regular way, but this volume of blood keeps the pressure high so the heart cannot, the valve cannot close until the pressure is equalized. So more blood gets into the heart. It's the only way known to man to increase heart stroke valve volume without stress to your body or your heart. So your heart filling time is much longer, which drops your heart rate. So your exercising heart rate is actually lower in the water. Your blood pressure is lower in the water because the heart isn't working so hard to pump all that blood up from your feet. The blood is already delivered without effort. So the body can work out without that same cardiovascular stress that it might have um, from pumping blood up from your lower extremities. So the heart slows down 10 to 17 beats per minute, and your heart pumps out about 32% uh, more blood with every heartbeat. So when that increased amount of blood goes through the extremities, it permeates tissues better because there's more volume moving through. And so the combined effect of hydrostatic pressure and the uh, increased blood volume helps to improve circulation out to the periphery um, throughout the body. Warm water softens all the tissues. 
<coughs> so that blood gets to move into soft tissues more easily than it does into cold ones. So warmer water pools are, are certainly better. Um, and that's about 88 to 92 degrees is more um, a therapeutic temperature. If you can find 86, that's great. 84 is a common uh, recreation pool temperature. Um, on a hot summer day, if it's outdoors, it might work for you. Otherwise, people wear, um, instead of wearing bathing suits into the pool, people are wearing the rush guards um, or the, the sun um, protection. Uh, you know, the little children have got full, full coverage clothes when they go into the swimming pool nowadays. And they have those clothes for adults too. So you can wear, um, in those cooler pools, you can wear uh, long leggings and um, crew neck shirts with long sleeves. You can keep the sun off and, and also keep your, your heat in if you can't find a, a warm water swimming pool. It's better for your skin. Pardon me? It's better for your skin. Um, she's saying that the covering the skin. Barrier creams are, are helpful. Um, creams with zinc. Um, and for the, the videotape, the, the question was, how do I protect my skin so against the chlorine in the pool? And uh, barrier creams work really well. Um, Avon used to have a barrier cream for putting on your hands for doing the dishes, mm -hmm. and it works really well. Anything with zinc in it, like baby, whoop, baby diaper rash um, creams also work for, for fragile skin. Uh, the other thing is to have your own pool where you can limit the amount of chemicals that you put in your pool. And if you were going to get in, get your own pool, I highly recommend a pool called the Vertical Pool. And the Vertical Pool only holds 900 gallons and it plugs into a regular outlet. And it warms up to say 90 degrees if you want it. It'll warm up warmer. It, um, it looks like a teacup. It actually appears quite small. You know Doctor Who's um, telephone booth? It's bigger on the inside than it is the outside. Well, the vertical pool is just like that. When you take the lid off and look inside, you go, whoa, it's big in there. Um, they can install it in a day, and it costs $10,000, which is, you know, way better than anything else in the market. And it allows you to have deep water or shallow water exercise. It has bench seats if you want a seated exercise. It has um, metal crossbars over top if you wanted to do chin-ups in the water or or uh, suspend a harness so if you're not safe in the water and you want to work out on your, on your own you can have somebody attach a harness have you suspended in the water and you can do your movements from there so it's made it was made for war veterans this fella uh, his name was phil i'm forgetting his last name but his neighbor ha had a stroke and he wanted to help his neighbor, so he built this therapeutic pool. And, uh, yeah. There are many uh, dimensions about It holds a 900 gallons. When they install it, it sits on the ground and comes about this far off. But they dig a five foot diameter hole, and it's, so it's all that deep water you don't really see. And they have a um, uh, an apparatus in it where you can lay on your belly and swim. It'll hold you in a place where you can go through the mechanics of swimming if that's your thing. Um, yes, it, it's round, but it's got a little piece off the end so you can do lying down or work in it. And the floor is changeable, so you can do shallow water exercise um, with your feet on the floor, or you can do deep water suspended exercise. The only disadvantage is that all those exercises happen on the spot. But it's big enough that you can do jumping jacks and cross-country skis in full range of motion. But it's, it's accessible or reachable for people to have their own pool if, if you live in a rural area where you don't have services. So on the web, it's called theverticalpool.com. 
So buoyancy, it has that upward thrust and it, whatever is in the water weighs zero. Whatever is out of the water is what you weigh. So if the water's to here, the weight of what, you, of what your head and shoulders is, is all the weight that you're bearing. So you can have non-weight bearing exercise. That means no compression on your feet, through your ankles and knees and hips. So when you're walking to and from these workshops and the hips and knees start to hurt, um, those things don't happen in, in the swimming pool. So with that lack of weight, the lack of compression forces shortening you, you have a little space between all your joints, your knees and your hips. And now when you move, there's space. So you've lifted, the bone on bone isn't happening anymore. There's just a little bit of space and the fluids that you have in your joints is there to lubricate the, the motion. So most water exercise is pain free. <laughs> I gotta move that out of the way. We, we, um, we all were at the same party that had wine before. <laughs> so here's me presenting with wine. <laughs> There's a picture of the vertical pool right there. Does anybody want to see it? Oh, yes. We have our own pool. But, uh, it's pretty cool. It's a good idea. It's been about Solar heaters and a cover do it, and I, you know, there's a lot of ways to do solar heat. Thank you. If, if you if you run water through a black hose, yeah. it gets very hot. If if you've got a, a stone wall fence and you run your your hose along it like this and then into your pool, I'm sure it would would uh, provide a great deal of heat. Thank you for that. Yeah, because basically it's just black. Yeah. Some of them leads that way. Yeah. But they just want to bring it up. Solar heat is advisable if you want a warmer pool because yeah. who wants to um, pay for that right. that extra warmth? Yeah. For sure. So that lack of compression for movement happens uh, in your spine as well, which is really helpful because back aches, pinched nerves, and so on, um, are really irritated or made worse by our weight over time. If we're waiting in line for hours or whatever, uh, it gets painful. So water, especially when your lungs are here, the lungs want to float up, and it gives you that nice space in your vertebrae. Breathing. Breathing is significantly affected when you're submerged by water, again, by that compression effect. I was just talking to two people at the, the wine and cheese party just prior to here, and the two ladies sitting side by side from different parts of the country both said, I can't go in the water because it causes me breathing anxiety. So our, when we breathe, when our lungs are completely submerged in water, that pressure is all around. So you have to be stronger with your breathing to move all that water out of the way, which is a positive effect. You strengthen your diaphragm and you strengthen all your, your breathing muscles. So if you're one of those people who has respiratory anxiety or a low um, tidal flow, low intake volume, you would sit on the steps or walk in hip depth water and breathe with that part of your body out of the water. And, and then say if you're sitting on the steps, you move down a step and you let the water come to here and you practice breathing uh, with the water at that level and then move to here. That creates breathing anxiety, then you go back up to the next step and continue to practice uh, your breathing. Eventually you can progress to doing deep water exercise where your entire your lungs are completely submerged and um, you really strengthen the diaphragm and the, the 
that exercise. So there's lots of ways that you can manipulate the water to get what you want. So those two ladies said, I can't go in the water ever again, but there's a way for them to be able to get by this and use it as a positive. Okay. Um, I was talking earlier about that increased blood volume. When you have that increased blood volume, uh, sev several things happen. One is called profound diuresis, which means you'll have to go pee. When you move more blood through your heart, you also move more blood through your kidneys. And then the kidneys doing their work fills the bladder faster. Um, there's been um, cases where people will go into the water, they'll feel the support, the freedom, exercise like crazy, and they haven't actually moved a whole lot before then. And this uh, increased amount of blood moving through the system will do a lot of toxic cleansing. And then there might be a feeling of, of nausea. Sometimes when people go for a massage and they, they get into stiff muscles that haven't, um, you're nodding your head, uh, where you, you felt had that happen. Um, and that's um, you know a high toxic load has been released out of the muscle tissues. Um, so this is also a positive in that there's increased toxic cleansing out of the blood from that increased blood flow combined with the warm water and the softening of the tissues um, that blood goes deeper. Um, in addition, uh, there's the effect of turbulence on the body. So when, if I walk powerfully through the water, I create a draft. And the person walking beside me might get pulled into my flow. Uh, funny story, I was kayaking one day and a tugboat was coming down the channel, one of those dredging tugboats. And my friend said, quick, paddle hard, hit the shore. So we paddled as hard and as fast as we could to run our boats right up on the shore. <clears throat> and that tugboat went by, and all the water out of the channel went with the tugboat. We were, the shoreline was 12 feet away from where our boats were. And it took a really long time for that water to come back. In fact, it didn't come back. We had to hop our bums up and down on the boat and, and hop the boats back to the water level. So um, when water moves, it does things. As a matter of fact, if I could borrow you for a minute, if she's new to the water and she's weak, I don't want to subject her to the turbulence of, say, other people walking in the water. Or if she walks forward in the water, the water's coming right at her and she has to be strong enough. So when I first start with her, I walk backwards, you walk forward, my back takes all the turbulence and the frontal plane resistance of the water, and then the water swirls around you and actually comes around and gives you a gentle little push. Thank you. <laughs> so it, it does help to have some knowledge about the principles of the water so that you can turn them all into a positive. Now, after a while, I have you working in the water. I might have you stand on one leg and balance in the pool, and then I'll go around like this, creating all kinds of turbulence for you to respond to. Make your brain sense what's happening with that turbulence and then respond by contracting globally all the muscles in your team. So, one of the nice things about water is that because of the universal resistance from head to foot, you, you can't just move sloppily in the water. And you, if, you, if you do, this is what people look like when they, when they walk in the water. They take their arms out because that will create a less resistance. So their arms up here and they leave their hips back. And the trunk is on a diagonal, because diagonals slice through water very easily. Whereas upright posture resists the water. So when I teach pool classes, I don't let anyone walk like that in the water. 
They have to lift their sternum, they have to squeeze their glutes, and walk powerfully through in the water. Now, on land, once our bodies have been compromised, we tend not to use the gliding functions within our joints. Now, my knee glides over my foot, my hips glide over my knee, and my shoulders glide over my hips, and my whole body walks forward in a smooth way. When people lose that connectivity throughout their body, they, they tend to not advance very far when they walk, and their upper body comes along as a consequence because it's attached to their hips. So one of the first things I teach people in the pool is we walk with our hips, not so much the legs. So this hip, the leg comes up, the hip needs to follow that leg and bring my trunk along into the walk. And then this shoulder comes forward with this hip and makes a nice convex C shape in the body. Whereas we don't see that when people walk so much, it's just all stiff. The gliding function. Um, I wish I could show this. I'll try. It might look, look odd. Um, when I'm here, notice how my hips can glide forward. We want to practice that in the water. So some people, when they first start in the pool, they go to the railings at the bottom of the stairs and the two railings come down. They hold those railings, they sit down low in the water, and they just glide, glide back and forth. And it restores that ability for the joints to glide one over top of the other for smooth ambulation. And if people come to the pool and they're in a flare and they've got brain fog, they're not breathing well, and they hurt all over, that's what they do. They just breathe out as the hips go back and they breathe in as the chest opens. And that's their, their pool therapy for that day. So turbulence, still talking about turbulence. So when I push my arms through the water, I can push my arms through the water like this, that's a slice, there will be very little resistance, and I won't have to brace my core to walk. And so if I'm not strong, I'll walk with a slice because I'm not ready for more resistance yet. But when I'm strong, I'm ready to do full range of motion, I'm going to push into the water. The harder I push into the water, the harder it pushes back against me, and the harder I have to brace to keep my feet on the floor and be stable through the movement of the exercise. So this quality of pushing against the water, the, the harder you push, the harder it pushes back. So there's no um, limit to how hard you can exercise in the pool. It'll meet you where you're at. So consequently, water exercise is very popular for sports injuries, football players, baseball players, etc., um, figure skaters. And one of the best um, uh, men in the aquatic therapy business is a fellow called Igor Verdenko, who has a clinic in Boston, and he um, immigrated from Russia where he worked solely with Olympic athletes to uh, compete, win against Americans. Anyway, he, uh, I don't know if you remember Nancy Kerrigan, yeah. when she got hit with the baseball bat by the other, yes. the other lady. Yes. Um, I, I studied Igor's work extensively when I first got into aquatic therapy, and his principles are amazing. He believes that um, you should train the body equally, left side, right side, top, bottom, front, back that you have a universal symmetry throughout your body with strength. Surely when you see a person walking like this, there's 
there is no uh, symmetry uh, left in that body. So tomorrow in the pool sessions I'll be teaching um, when you come across a, a weakness in your body, we really work that weakness. We don't work their strengths. I don't allow the students to stay in their strengths. The problem, one of the problems with self-guided work, workouts is that everybody works their strongest muscles. They do the things that make them feel really good and consequently they overwork their strengths and they, they gloss over their weaknesses or spend very little time on their weaknesses. When we get weak, does anyone have the experience when they do a hamstring curl, they get a, a hamstring cramp? Mm -hmm. Or when they point their toe, they get a foot cramp? So, this is not scientifically proven, but I believe in my heart of hearts and all the years of experience that I've had working with people in the water, that cramping may not be caused from a, a change in the levels of calcium and potassium in your body. I think they're caused from a muscle group getting weakened. And our brain has been trained since we were little to do our movements automatic. There's a, a railroad track or a, a pattern that the brain follows, a firing pattern, and it tells the muscles what to do and when. So it tells that hamstring to fire, and the hamstring is now not the same hamstring that it was when that pattern was learned by your brain. So I think it's like a com computer glitch where the weakness in that muscle can't receive that message to fire in the same way that it used to handle the message before. So, personal opinion. What I find is when people strengthen their hamstring, uh, the hamstring should be two-thirds as strong as the hip flexors, uh, when you get that relationship in balance, you don't get those hamstring cramps anymore. And when you strengthen your feet and ankles from exercising, those cramps become rare and rare. So this principle of symmetrical strength, balancing the muscle on either side of the joint so that you have uh, a better relationship between the group, groups, Restoring that strength so that those messages that come from the brain are being received by um, the muscle in a different way. Okay. I'll talk a little bit about um, breathing. Any exercise program in the water or otherwise should involve some education around the breath. I personally believe that because of stressors, catastrophes that happen in our life, um, years of stress, like say getting your degree in university, um, and say being in a relationship where you're afraid of your partner. You know, you, you go for years constricted, you know, years of pushing and worry and your breath changes in those kinds of times and when we become upper chest breathers instead of diaphragmatic breathers um, it changes the whole physiology that's happening in the body that diaphragmatic breath is happening um, and has side effects that keep us healthy so when we go in the water, we want to breathe in through the nose, breathe out through the mouth, and breathe deeply into the diaphragm, and strength train that diaphragm by pushing the water out of the way. Now when our diaphragm goes down, it pushes the liver and the stomach and the intestines down a little bit. It's not air that's in the belly, it's your organs that have been pushed down by the diaphragm. So the diaphragm sits in your rib cage, like so. And when it contracts, it flattens, giving lots of space above to breathe in, and it pushes the organs down. What that does is it basically, it's an internal pump. 
it moves fluid around your liver, your intestines, your stomach, and it comes up and it touches the bottom of the heart and lungs, helping to move them a little bit, and it distributes fluids evenly throughout this, the, the quadrants in the body, which is helpful. When we become an upper chest breather and our diaphragm um, atrophies and has a, a smaller motion, um, our core doesn't have as good blood flow moving through it. Our ribs should move open with our breath. And when we're upper chest breathers, our ribs don't flare out like the gills of a fish. Now, our spine, we have discs in between each vertebrae, and those discs do not have a blood supply of their own. So when we take a big breath and our, and our ribs open, the, the blood, or the, the ribs open, then the vertebrae lift, and there's just a small space there that allows fresh fluid and nutrients to move in to oxygenate those cells. And then when we breathe out, the ribs compress, and the discs come together, and they push out the waste products of work. So that breathing creates a pumping action in our vertebrae that keeps our discs healthy and keeps our nervous system healthy and keeps all of this healthy. So no matter if you never step foot in the water, <laughs> do um, assess your own breathing and how much your ribs move, how much you can expand, what your breath volume is. And, and I, I believe that most disease processes start with poor oxygenation of the cells. And after years and years of that, um, the cells don't respond in the same, in the same way. They, they lose gravity. So combining a breath practice with your aquatic therapy is key to, to a healthy nervous system, um, healthy organs, and uh, healthy the breathing muscles. So water therapy is really, really good for pre and post surgery. So if you're getting a knee replacement or a joint replacement, it's really good to work out in the water for a few months before your surgery and try and increase your range of motion before the surgery. Because it really isn't fun when you get your knee replacement finished and you have no range of motion and you need to break through tissues to get that range of motion after the fact. So trying to get as much as you can pre-surgery. Um, some medical uh, departments allow um, aquatic therapy 10, 10 to 14 days post-surgery. Others don't allow you to go in the water for a long time at all. Um, but know that there are some medical systems that put you in the pool as soon as the sutures are healed because it's, it's very effective. So water exercise is recommended when there's pain with land exercise or when your health conditions are so complicated that rehab for one part of your illness negatively affects the other part. So water is really good for taking complicated medical conditions and um, making the effort gentle and pain-free so that you're not hurting one part while you're rehabbing another. A water exercise is great for inadequate trunk stability, for inefficient circulation, inadequate balance, for obesity, post-back surgery, uh, post-mastectomy and recovery. Um, the hydrostatic pressure of the water does help with lymphedema. And so the cancer patients are doing rehab in the water. Um, it's great for, for children, for developmental delay. Uh, it's good for muscle conditioning, uh, for cardiovascular endurance, for fear of falling, uh, for postural alignment, muscle weakness in fragile bones, um, limited range of motion and poor flexibility, for chronic pain, for knee and hip replacements, diabetes, arthritis, inflammation, autoimmune disorders, sports and orthopedic injuries, 
and a need for general fitness and conditioning, and a, a need for cross training. So say for instance you're a cyclist and your posture is now starting to look like this because that's the position you are on the bike and, and so taking that training in the water helps balance get more upper strength activity. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Have you ever worked with uh, the uh, treadmills that go in the water? You know, I'm, uh, if, if it helps a person stay connected to an exercise, um, if, if it makes a person do the exercise, I think they're great. I don't think you need hardly anything to get into the water. It is the universal gymnasium equipment all by itself. So um, if gadgets make you do more, then absolutely. But otherwise, um, being on the treadmill is, is going to train gait. But what if you want to um, train um, posture rebalancing or um, train arm strength or um, ankle range of motion, for instance. One of the things that I see is horrible, horrible ankle range of motion with just about everybody that comes into an aquatic therapy program. The reason being is gravity um, holds us to the ground. We stand upright because our bones are stacked one on top of the other and held together with ligaments and muscles. But over time, we get soft and we gravity starts to take us closer to the ground. And, uh, and why am I saying this? Um, ah, the ankles. <laughs> so our ankles have learned, if they just hold in this one spot, then my knees are in the right place over my foot, and then my hips are in the right place over my knees. And I can stand here even though I'm weak and I have poor postural alignment because I've got a hard floor under my feet and I have gravity um, giving me that pressure. So when we, there's one of the exercises that is the most powerful in the pool is doing motions from a cubit exercise here. And my knees, can move easily over my toes. But if your ankles are really tight, it prevents you getting down onto the floor and back up again. Your ankle range of motion is so important. Um, just talking about the ankles has reminded me about falls. That poor range of motion in the ankles isn't helpful for when you're not in that one balanced position the ankles look after. So as soon as you go outside of that narrow balance ability, you have an increased fear of incidence of falling. So in the water we do these cube exercises and we get that ankle range of motion back. Uh, question? Um, <clears throat> two things. First, you have given us fabulous amount of information. I'm a nurse, but a lot of this is very, very new to me. Do you have any kind of handout or any way we can access this information? Yes, I, um, on this the website. Okay, so this will be on the website. It probably already is from previous years. Okay. Um, you, you can have it. <laughs> awesome. Okay, right there. And um, my, my email address is my name at Gmail. And if for any reason you want that and you can't get it, just email me and I'll send it to you in, in a file. I've heard a lot of presentations. I have never heard the amount of information that you have given us tonight. I, I think you're fabulous. Presentations <laughs> online. <laughs> Swimming and in the winter, went to the water. 
but I had been thinking about it in my sadness of in my 26th year. In 2007 in Canada, I jumped into a pool, discovered I couldn't swim. The legs wouldn't work, I, I could float, so I rolled over on my back. But um, after that, I talked to my doctor, and he ordered pool therapy. And we discovered, I in say, chest cape one. I could walk backwards 50 miles an hour. I couldn't go forward or side. The only thing I wanted me to do is walk across the pool. Because of the effect of the quads with the yeah. arm and the arm. And the backwards, zoom. And like, is that just because specific muscles were affected that it would be that crazy? Um, the IBM tends to hit the quads and the muscles in the front of the leg first and uh, some of the core body. Um, the w walking backwards, even though you may not have been as strong as, as you used to be, you were still stronger than the muscles on the front of the body and that gliding action that you require for forward movement has probably gone, whereas that gliding action isn't so prevalent with, with that words movement. Yes. Then, do uh, you, you think that uh, the, uh, in, instead of swimming laps, that the water aerobics is there for you? Okay, so, patient, uh, right, um, very good question. The question was, um, should I swim laps, or should I do water aerobics or aquatic therapy? Um, I feel that swimming is getting through water streamlined with the least resistance possible so that you can get as far as possible quickly. Aquatic therapy is like a snow plow after a big east coast storm where you want to move that water and get, get strong from it. So you can swim. You know how when you look at a horse and his belly hangs down like that? Some people swim like that. They can swim with no core stability at all because the water is supporting their belly. So I think swimming is fantastic. It's really good for certain ranges of motion, but it's very specific. It doesn't incorporate all the ranges of motion that the body has. But one thing that swimming with your face in the water is really good for is you get into a zen kind of state. Because as soon as your nose goes in the water and stays there, um, your nervous system um, clicks into what they call the diver's reflex. And your brain starts to secrete relaxing into your bloodstream so that if you were to go down to the bottom of the pool and not come up right away, that your muscles are more relaxed and you're using less oxygen. So it's a life-saving uh, primitive response from when we came out of the ocean and became landlubbers, apparently. Um, so really good for your breathing, that rhythmic breathing when the, th the face is in. And you know, this motion here is less functional for land, um, whereas you know motions you know through the water in different ways are more functional for active daily living. So for swimmers, I'd say keep swimming, don't stop, but try and stabilize your trunk when you swim, uh, vary your swim uh, the strokes that you do, do some side stroke, do some back stroke, and also. Um, do some vertical exercise, do some deep water running. So if you're in a lane, use that lane, jog or cycle through the shallow, and then have a belt on, and then take it off into the deep, and you've got all that resistance from here to there that's forcing you to have a stable core. So deep water running is, is fantastic. There's zero impact, but all that resistance on your full frontal plane. Um, it's a great way to rehab if you've, you know, got an ankle, knee, or hip injury, and you can't be load bearing. You know, don't 
Don't wait until you're all your muscles atrophy. Get in the pool now and keep it keep it moving. Use the deep end. So uh, I think a lot of runners, um, when they can't run on land anymore for an injury, they don't want to lose their cardiovascular fitness. So they'll take their running into the water. And then when the rehab's over, they're well ahead of the game. Yes? Uh, mm, I used to do a lot of ballroom dancing. Ballroom dancing, yes. And mm, all of a sudden, I couldn't walk across the floor. Uh, my balance was off. I thought I had broken a hip. Then I went to um, the doctor and said, no, your bones are okay, it's your muscles. How do you strengthen your posture and walking in the water? Um, what exercises should I do? Okay, are you coming to the yeah, tomorrow? <laughs> we, we have three pool sessions tomorrow. Uh, I'd like to answer that question by, by showing you. Um, I have lots and lots of tools in my kit because I was um, teaching at conventions for so many years. So I have so many ways to approach that. And one of my clients, um, John Suttle, who um, is on the board of directors here, I work with him um, Friday afternoons at 5 in his pool in Atherton, California. And uh, he says, you, you never do the same thing from week to week. And I said, well, I do that because I won't get bored, because you won't get bored. <laughs> You'll keep me around a lot longer. <laughs> but it keeps everything interesting, and it, and it varies everything so that we use different muscle groups to um, make sure we don't have any blind spots in our, in our training program. So I would do just a ton of things uh, with you. Well, one of the things that we, we need to do in the water is, um, when I take this foot off the ground, if my hip wasn't be able, able to stabilize and stay level, this hip would drop and I would fall over. And if my bones are really weak, I might actually break the other hip because the, the force is being pushed out this way. So one of the exercises we do in the pool, we call it the Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> this is the, these muscles right here, they're called quadratus laborum, and they elevate the hip. So the hips are meant to, when I weight shift, when this foot comes off the floor and I weight shift, notice how my shoulders are moving. My, my hips move. My hips have to move side to side, one to two inches as a foot comes off the floor. My hips have to elevate one to two inches to prevent that drop so my toe doesn't trip on, on the floor um, and that the hip doesn't drop so that I have that side to side gait or a falling gait. Um, it's interesting, um, the backwards thing. Mm -hmm. You know, when I do the Charlie Chaplin forward, I got teeny, teeny little steps. But when I do the Charlie, Ch when I do that same exercise backwards, so I've got hip rotation. Mm -hmm. All those muscles in the, in the glutes that help with the move, if that gives you more information for your, your story. I would really love to ride lupus I can't hear the sun. Big hat, big hat, long sleeve shirt, uh, leggings, sunscreen, big hat, sunglasses. Where is the pool? Uh, there's a great big pool out here. That's, that's not the one you're going to be in? No, no. It's got the waterfall and it's going to have the children. And beer. And beer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, if you go this way through the building, you know how there's that big foyer mm -hmm. on that, that side? And you look out there and you see a fountain, and then there's a bank of trees, there's two buildings, bank of trees. The, the pool we're going to is right behind that fountain. Okay. So you go out the front door, to the left, by the first building, towards the second building, and then there'll be a gate 
or a fence between those two buildings and you come through that way. It'll have a hot tub as well as uh, in the pool. It's got deep water and shallow water and there should be no one else there but us. Yes, it, it's on the map. 9.15 tomorrow? 9.15, I'm hoping, high level. Pe people are still walking and strong, come early. Those in wheelchairs come later on in the day. Um, I'm hoping. Because if I get high level and low level people together, it'll be, be hard to meet the needs of everyone. Hopefully we'll have three small groups. Uh, where I can give you lots of attention. If you want, I'm here the entire weekend, even though I finish presenting uh, tomorrow. I will do private sessions with anybody, um, evening, after the conference, lunch hours, whatever, um, and, and provide you that experience one-on-one. -on -one. Can you point if you don't mind on this? Yep, right there between towers five and six, that oh, pool right there. Oh, should, there's a question of how do you find an aquatic therapist in your area or, or a swimming pool that... Um, there, there are several organizations. Um, there's the Aquatic Therapy University. It used to be called the Aquatic Network. They ran a site that says findapool.com. Um, bodies, uh, organizations that certify people like me or aqua fitness instructors, they will often post on their website who's certified. Um, so going after those organizations will help. Um, the Aquatic Therapy and Rehabilitation Institute has an e-list. And if you sign up on there um, or email them and say, can you do a posting for me? I don't really want to sign up. And they'll put a post on there for you that so-and-so lives in this area. This is their email contact if any therapists are in the area contact them. Um, hospitals will often have swimming pools and rehab apartments. And that's another good place to ask. Um, some physical therapy clinics have their own pools. There's one in Pleasanton, California that I, that I know of. Um, yeah. And I would be happy to post on the aquatic therapy listing um, for you. I've, I've tried to help people from conventions before um, find therapists. Or um, there was one lady in our last workshop. She just goes to the Y and it was still really, really helpful. You can run on the spot, ski, jumping jacks, full range of motion um, in that swimming pool. And it's got a, a little thing that you can lay on to do um, swimming exercises if, if you want. Yeah. And so even if you don't um, work out in water, just being in it is helpful. As a matter of fact, um, there's a story about this one woman who needed a dialysis. There was no dialysis available for her. Um, so they put her in a tank of water up to here, and she lost 15 pounds of urine from her body that moved through her skin. Yeah. So it, it can be a can be a bit of a lifesaver. Any other questions? Good. Well, I hope to see you all in the pool tomorrow. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't get your name. Shirley Beebe, and it's on on the handout. And if you need to contact me, it's my name at Gmail. All one word, all the word.